I think this is some of the most important content when it comes to the Christian life. I think we need, as Christians, as people, we need simple habits, don't we? We need simple habits that will drive success. You know, they, they say that money doesn't grow on trees, right? That'd be simple, right? Just go out there and, and, and some people say, well, I need to go out there and shake the money tree. <laughs> and that just seems so simple, doesn't it? And you just wonder, you know, is, is it really that easy? Of course not, unless you own an apple orchard or something. But here's the reality. When we talk about making habits simple in the Christian life, that produce fruit in ours. We all want to be better Christians. I would hope that everyone here this morning is not here under pressure or duress. I hope that everybody here has come freely because they want to hear what God has to say to them. And you know what? My goal is to make that simple. And not only am I trying to make it simple, I'm trying to give you simple habits that are simple. And here we are, we, we land on our, on our seventh and final point. I talked about four internal habits. Four internal habits, and now we're working on our third external habit. So it's really seven habits, but they're all simple. We talked about pursuing wisdom. We talked about prioritizing meditation, persevering in prayer. We talked about practicing memorization. Those are things that happen internally with a Christian. And I tell you what, if you talk to Christians that are successful, that are happy, we're not talking that are wealthy businessmen, we're talking about just successfully happy Christians, you will find that generally speaking, they do all four of those. And the less happy you are, we could just start counting them off. You know, which ones aren't you doing? Which ones aren't you doing? Why aren't you happy as a Christian? Is it because you're not pursuing wisdom? Is it, not be- is it because you're not prioritizing meditation or persevering in prayer or practicing memorization? Which one of those things? And, and when you get to the external habits, man, I tell you what, friends, these are evident. Generally speaking, you can be in the quietness of your own house. You can be pursuing wisdom. You can be dealing with, with your meditation and your memorization and all your prayer and doing all that in the quietness of your house. But when you want to see what's manifest in a person's life, it comes out externally. So then we begin to talk about these three things, right? Participating in fellowship, preparing for service, and now the final one. This will probably be one of the hardest messages you have to take in. This is, uh, this is what most churches are stereotyped for. And it's not being hypocritical. Now that is a stereotype for churches. But this is a different stereotype. This is a stereotype that you say, all the pastor ever talks about is this one thing. That's all he ever talks about. He comes into church and he, 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 uh, he prays and, uh, and then he takes up an offering. This morning we're talking about giving. We're talking about planning your giving. Plan your giving. Now this is a big part of the Christian life. I mean, this is, this is much bigger than what you would expect. I have, I have often asked people who, in churches uh, who sing for, for 30 minutes. We've, we've, we all know those churches, right? You sing for the bulk of the time. And I ask them, I say, well, should things be done proportionally? They say, well, yeah. I say, that's why you sing so much. Yeah. I say, if the New Testament is written to the church, how much time should be given towards, towards singing? They say, oh, a lot. Yeah, that's it. I say, well, how many times in the New Testament? Is singing mentioned? And it always gets a shock. Like you always get a shock. Look, oh, there's a lot. I can't mention them all. Well, can you mention five? Oh, I'm sure I could mention five. No, you can't. Because there's only four times in the New Testament that music is mentioned. A couple of those times are singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. But you know how many times giving is mentioned in the New Testament. You see, the church predominantly spends most of the time 
in worship, and they call worship singing. And they spend this little sliver of time, this, this little, little itty-bitty splinter of time for offering, because it's so offensive, isn't it? Because, because you don't want to talk about money, because that's what people are tied to. You don't want to talk about giving. And we're, even, even if you took the word money out, and didn't even talk about that, and, you, and said, the giving of your time, and people say, well, I tithe my time. Oh, do you? You have 24 hours in a day. That's 2.4 hours if you equate a tithe as being 10%, which it is. Do you give God 2.4 hours? Well, maybe on a Sunday. So you're not really tithing then, your time. I mean, even if you took money out, people don't like to talk about giving. But you know, it's a shame. Because if we believe the Bible's true, then it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. If the, if the New Testament's written in the church, we ought to look through it and say, how many times is giving mentioned? And do that proportionally to how much music is, is sung. I think, you'd be, I think you'd be shocked if we came in here, we sang for one minute, and we sat down, and I spent the next 15 minutes of every service singing, or uh, uh, taking an offering. You'd be like, okay, this pastor has gone overboard. But here's the reality. Why do we major on minors? Why do we major on minors? Why do we, do, why do we spend so much time doing something that, that has lesser value? If you talk about value from the Scripture, I'm not, talking, I'm not trying to value this. We spend very little time. Now, let me say this. As I preach through this, I'm going to preach declaratively. But I'm not going to preach condemningly. This is a very generous church. So I look across the landscape of generous people. And I don't mean that flippantly. We have a generous church. And I believe all of you give. Now, I don't know, uh, you know, when cash comes into into the plate, I don't know who gives that. I mean, it's got a name on there, but it's usually, you know, Benjamin, Franklin, or Washington. Usually it's not Benjamin. Usually it's a little, it's not Benjamin. It's usually Washington or Jackson, right? But here's the thing. I don't know who gives it. So I'm not, this isn't condemning. I'm not condemning anybody. You all understand that, right? You understand that? I want you all to nod your head yes. yes. All nod your head yes. Like this. Like this. I want you to take off, pretend like you have a hat of offense. We have a hat of offense. For some of you, it's going to say cubs on it. For some of you, it's going to say socks on it. Let's just take the hat of offense off today, okay? And let me talk to you as people. This is an awesome message if you just allow it to work in your life. This is an awesome message. Because when you show me a Christian that's happy. You show me a Christian that's happy and I'll show you a generous, cheerful giver. You show me a happy Christian, I'll show you a Christian that says, all that I have is thine. There's a real connection between Christian growth and giving. Christian growth and giving. There's a real connection there. Now just because a person has a lot of money doesn't mean they give a lot of money. You know, I know some some really successfully wealthy people who have all sorts of money who give less money than some of the people I know that have less money. They give, actually, they give more money than than the other people. And I, and I, and you know, you look at these people and they're just, they're never pleased, these, these unhappy Christians who have a lot, who don't give hardly anything. They're never really happy. I mean, they, 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 they exude some characteristics of joy, but it's not, they're not internally, they're not satiated. There's no satisfaction in their life. Someone once said, 
He said, the truth is, giving is a heart issue. It's not a money issue. Giving is a heart issue, not a money issue. And you see, that is why, that is why someone who has so little can give so much, and why someone who has so much oftentimes gives so little. Because it's not a money issue. People will oftentimes say this. They'll say, well, if I had a lot of money, I'd give it. But what are you doing right now with your money? Well, I don't have any to give. Then what makes you think that when you have a lot, you'll give a lot? It doesn't make sense. Because giving is not a money issue. Giving is a heart issue. There's a couple things that we need to talk about before we get into the message. So, the very first thing is, um, is it really deals with perspective. It deals with perspective. Okay? First of all, we need to ask ourselves, is our perspective right? Is our perspective right? I would, I would venture to guess that everybody here, if I was to say, do you, believe, do you believe God? You would say, well, yes, I, I trusted Christ as my Savior, and, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I believe him for salvation. Okay? I, I would venture to guess uh, everybody, everybody here believes that. But I, if I was to ask you, I mean, do you really believe God? I mean, do you have, do you have faith that, that is substantial? Or do you have the kind of faith that says, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I mean, where is your faith at? Do you really believe uh, there is a God? And do you really believe he saved you? And do you really believe that he's actively working in your life? Because, friends, if you don't believe that in totality, if you say, well, I believe he saved me, and I believe there is, he's God, and, and, that, and, that, and that he has, has worked in times past, then you're going to miss this entire message. You have to have your perspective right. You have to believe that not only that God can save you, but that he, can, that he can satisfy all of your needs all the time. That he is the God of the universe. How many of you look into the heavens and you say, I know that I know that I know that I know that God made this place. This is crazy. When I drive down the road and I say, man, this is just amazing that God made all this. Like, I know that I know. And there are a lot of people that don't have that same that same belief. I mean, let's face it, if, if the God of heaven came to this earth to die on the cross to pay for our sins simply by, all we need to do is trust him by faith, and he writes it in a book, all the record of everything he's done, and he writes it and he contains it in these pages. If this is his message to us, if this is what he said to us, if he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, if he has said everything in here that we need, why don't we read it? Why aren't we seeking God's face all the time? See, if your perspective is wrong, you're not going to get this message. Now this is story. It's a, it was meant to be a joke. It's not funny nowadays. But there was a, a story of a gunman who came into the back of church during church service. He stood up with his gun and he started shooting the ceiling out. And vast majority of people left. He said something to the effect of, any of you folks want to leave, leave now. Almost everybody left. There's about four people left. He sat down in the back pew and he says, go ahead, preacher. Now that all the hypocrites are gone. You know, we come today not to hear me, but the preaching of God's word. If we really believe this, friends, if you believe this, if you believe it and you believe it with your whole heart, th th this, sh this should change a behavior. N I'm not talking salvation. This is not a salvation issue. We trust by faith that he saves us. He saves us. We're talking about serving. We're talking about the disciplines of a Christian life. Apart from salvation, now we become, now he, he, he now he becomes our master Lord, not just Savior. 
But if we really believe that he saved us now, and this is really his word, then we ought to take heed to what he says. And we have to get our perspective right. That's number one. Number two. I better get to the message. Number two. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your money. I'm glad I took up the offering before I said that. People be like, well, the preacher says that he doesn't need my money. Do it without me then, pastor. Kid. He doesn't need our money, though. You know, you know, who's the, you know who the one is? He, he created all things, right? You know who's missing out on the blessing when we don't give to the Lord? You know who's, you know who's missing the blessing? It's not God. And it's not me as the pastor. Okay? Because God will provide it when he wants to provide it. You know who's missing out on the blessing? You guys. Me. When I don't give, I'm missing out. When you don't give, you're missing out. That's who's missing out on the blessing. Now, this is not, I'm not trying to guilt anybody. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. He doesn't need our money. We have to understand that, that he, it's, it's all his. Everything that is, is his. 1 Corinthians 10.26. Bear with me on this. 1 Corinthians 10.26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Deuteronomy mentions something similar. Behold, the heavens and the heavens of heavens is the Lord's. Thy God, the, oh, by the way, uh, the earth also. With all that therein is. I mean, not just the earth, but everything that is there. He mentions in Psalm 24, he says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Oh, and the world. And they that dwell therein. That's his too. He goes on to say in Psalms 89.11, The heavens are thine, the earth also is thine. As for the world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded them. Not only are they his, but he made them. And throughout Scripture, you find a thread of all the things that belong to God. It's really, really great. In, uh, in Psalm 50, the, the worlds belong to God. In Psalm 95, the valleys, uh, that's the deep places, he says in Psalm 95, 4. The deep places, the valleys and the hills, they belong to God. The sea belongs to God in Psalm 95. Uh, in Psalm 50, the animals belong to God. And then he kind of breaks it down. He says in Psalm 50, verse 11, the fowl and the beast belong to God. He says that uh, in Leviticus 27, 30, all things on the land belong to God. Uh, he says in Psalm 74, that the day and the night belong to God. In Daniel 2, 20, he says that wisdom and might belong to God. And he just sums it up in Romans 12. And he says, even vengeance is mine. He says, it all belongs to me. I don't care who gives what. He says, because I own it. Now that is cool. He says, your car, your kids, your house, your job, the seat you sit in, the clothes you put on your back, they don't belong to you either. All belongs to God. And he can do whatever he wants with what is his. Now, friends, if we have the wrong perspective, we're going to think that we own what it is that we give. And I have said oftentimes it's not a matter of how much money we want to give to the Lord, but it's how much of God's money we want to keep for ourselves. It's all his. Your body is his. People who don't take care of themselves, that's God's body. The kids are God's. The roads that Davenport can't seem to figure out, they belong to God too. And the trucks that are supposed to take care of the roads in Davenport, those belong to God. Even if there's a note on those. People say, well, you own your car? No, the bank does. No, God owns the bank. Let's think bigger. God owns everything. The person who's missing out on the blessing is not God. Because it all belongs to him anyway. So many people want to retain what's rightfully his. Now, I'm preaching to a giving church, so don't get me wrong. I'm not asking for more money. You understand that? You all nod your head, yes. I'm not asking for more money. This is between you and God. This isn't between me and you. This is between you and God. 
I just see my offering going down next week. But, but it's God's offering. That's the truth of it. Remember when we took up the, the building fund? I said there's, there's, there's all sorts of crazy strategies. There's all sorts of plans. The 10-point plan, the five-week plan, the incremental plan, all these things. And I just looked at you folks and said, if we don't get it, we don't build. It's, it's that, that's, that's just the reality of it. And we took up an offering. And God is faithful. If he wants us to build, we'll build. And we'll build exactly when he, when he wants us to build, exactly how he wants us to build, exactly what he wants us to build. It all belongs to God. But people hold this thing, this cash, so close. One guy, he said this. He said, plenty of people are willing to give God credit, yet few are willing to give him cash. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of apropos. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was funny too. It's true. It's just how we are though. You know, someone once said to me, and I, and, and I, and I, have, I have found this out to be true, that giving financially to the Lord is generally the very last thing people surrender to God because it's the closest thing to their heart. It's what they trust the most. It's what they confide in the most. It's generally the very, very last thing they give. And you know what, ironically? It's the very first thing they pull out when they become unsurrendered to God. More churches have been, have been stopped from closing because the pastor does watch the finances. And, and, and in love, he watches them and he says, wait a second, these, person, these people have, have become less faithful in their giving. Something's going on in their life. And they have reached out to these people and said, is there something going on in your life? And usually the pastor can insert himself and help somebody. Financially speaking, spiritually speaking, the finances is the last thing a person gives to the Lord because it's the closest thing they hold, the most valuable. If you could surrender anything in your house, what would be the very last thing you surrender? The things you hold the most valuable. And it's also the first thing you take out of the house. If my house is on fire, I'm going for my family. I'm not taking anything with me. As a matter of fact, I will make sure that they get out before I get out. That's how valuable they are to me. Think of the same thing when it comes to giving. So it's a great barometer. It's a great litmus test for you folks. Okay? Now, that's not for me. I, I, I know what I give. My wife and I know what we give. That's it. But, but you, this is for you. You ask yourselves, you do a forensic internal audit on your own bank statements and say, where is my money going? It's not my money anyway. Where is God's money going? What am I doing with God's money? Okay, so now let me start. That was my introduction. I'm going to make this quick, painless. Three things. First, first of all, when dealing with our, our, our giving, we need to have the right perspective, right? But it should be planned, it should be personal, and it should be proportionate. It should be planned, it should be personal, and it should be proportionate. Um, 1 Corinthians 16.2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering, gatherings when I, when I come. There needs to be a level of intentionality when it comes to our giving. There needs to be a level of intentionality. Why is it that, that, that our giving is always like reactive? It's always an afterthought, not a forethought. Okay? Uh, our, giving, our giving should be, it should be intentional. It shouldn't be something like we accidentally, you know, I, I don't know how many of you do this, and, and I just honestly don't know. And again, this is not condemnatory. It's declarative. It's not condemnatory. You do whatever you want to do with your money. It's not yours anyway. It's God's. And, and you, know what? I, I, you know what? I see it that way, which is really nice. I see it as not yours. It's God's. How many of us take time to make sure that we, 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 we make sure that we allocate money to God? Now we're talking giving. Okay? Again, this is really tough. This is abrasive. Everybody's like going, pastor knows how much I give. He doesn't know how much I give. No, that's, 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 that's nonsense. 
this is the, you're the one missing out, not the church, because God would, could just take care of us like that, and it's fine. Okay, so this is really between you and him. How many of you write your check as an afterthought? How many of you, how many of you take time to allocate funds prior to coming to church? Now, I'm not saying writing a, writing a check in your pew is bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we need to give with some intentionality. It needs to be, there needs to be some thought. Uh, we could talk about sacrifice here too. Just briefly touch on this. There are some people who have a million dollars who could drop 20 grand and give to the church. And that doesn't impress me. It doesn't. I'm thankful for it. You know what impresses me? is when someone has 20000 and they give 10000 That impresses me. Proportionally, and we're going to talk about proportion in just a moment. There needs to be some forethought in our giving. Now, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of ways to give, right? People give uh, online, not here. It's funny. I, I have this conversation with churches, and, and they say, oh, we're getting 40% of our offering online, and they got these massive budgets, and I'm like, Dude, I got $100 last year. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have an online giving thing that cost me $120 and I spent, and I only got $100. Didn't he cover it? It's crazy. Now, if you want to give online, that's fine. Uh, people talk about giving uh, uh, weekly with kind of like a reoccurring thing. That's totally legit. I don't think it's as intentional as, as writing a check. And I don't think, I don't think the intention is... is is as, is as predominant as flipping out $20 bills, right? 20, 40, 60, 81. 20, 40, 60, 82. 20, 40, 60, 80. That's a grill. I could have bought a new grill this spring. 20, 40, 60, 84. I could have bought my new tires. 20, 40, 60, 85. 20, 40, 60, 86. I mean, you start, to, you start to shell out the cash, and you start to go, Whoa. I think there's some intention. Now, I'm not saying to give cash. Give a check. It's fine. Matter of fact, I, I'd rather you give a check because then you get tax right off. So all I'm saying is this. Give with intentionality. Make it mean something. And if you got a billion dollars and you give a million, that'll help the church. Don't get me wrong. But what I think is amazing is when I see that somebody has hardly anything, and they give a significant amount. That, to me, is amazing. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And for where your heart is, there will be your treasure also. I think you can flip those. Uh, when you give, we should do it joyfully. Okay? We should do it joyfully. Uh, every man, this is what it says, so women don't have to give. Just kidding. <laughs> Every man, according as he hath prospered in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. This, this should not be a punishment for any one of us. We are, we, we are receiving the blessing. Now, I'm not saying God's going to multiply your income. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that when we give, let's, man, it should be a joy. It should be a joy. People actually, I, I like to give. Now, I know that sounds really stupid. It's like, well, you're the pastor. You get your own money back. No, not necessarily. Here's the reality. I actually like to give. I have a good perspective. I believe God is real. I believe he wrote this thing. And I also believe that what I have is not mine. I'm just a steward of it. We should give, give cheerfully. We should have a, a spring in our step and a song in our heart when we give to the Lord. This should change us. This should move us. We should be excited. We should come and we should be like, man, I got my check ready. And man, I got my money ready. And, I, and it's not mine. It's God's money. And I, I'm just excited to give back a portion of what he's given to me. He's not asking for 100%. He's saying, you can keep 90% of my money. Now, we can talk about tithing and how it's not mentioned in the New Testament. And I get that. I get tithing. 10% is not mentioned in the New Testament. I get that. But let me ask you something. Should we do less for God under grace than we did under the law? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there's plenty of principle that talks about giving and et cetera, et cetera. This is great. Great quote. One guy says, 
the, the, the root, uh, root word for miserable is miser. Those people who are stingy, who just have, a, have like a firm grip on their cash. You know, some of the, some of the, some of the happiest people I, I, I see are the people who, who walk around and just, uh, you know, just bless people. Man, I don't know. To me, it's just it's fun to give. It's fun. I love it. I told God, I said, Lord, if you give me a, if you give me a million dollars, I'll give it all away. I'm waiting for him to say, I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs> Give joyfully. Here's, here's another good thought. Give from the top. Give from the top. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thy increase. This is, a, this, is a, this is Bible, okay? So this isn't me telling you. I mean, I'm telling you, but I'm telling you what God said. It's in the Bible. Check it out. Uh, Proverbs 3 9. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thy increase. You know what that means? Give him from the top. People say, they say, well, uh, before or after taxes. I'm like, well, the government took it before taxes. Uh, government takes it from the top. I think God can have it from the top too. Right? I mean, man, I, I, that's the way I do it. They say, well, what about, what about all the increase? Well, it says all the increase. I, I had family members of mine who says, you don't have, now these are family members of mine, who said, well, you don't have to tithe on your birthday gift if someone who gave you the birthday gift tithed on it. I wish the government would do that with taxes. It's been taxed on once, don't worry about it. That's not how they roll. I say, yeah. I mean, that says increase. Increase. Uh, to me, that means increase. So when God gives you something, you give from the increase. When God gives me $20 for my, for my birthday, which is still really nice these days, you do, I tithe on that. But what about, what about your tax return? You get a tax return back, do you tithe on it? Sometimes I've given the whole thing. And you know what? It feels good to write those checks. It's not my money anyway. It's all God's. You plan to give. Do you plan this way? Do you say, how can I, how can I give more to God? Because the only person that's out of blessing is you. And that's the truth. If God created this world, he'll do anything he wants to do. You can just be part of the blessing. You can be blessed and be part of it because you gave. Give from the top. All thine increase. It should be planned. It should be personal. It should be personal. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you, let every one of you, lay by him in store as God hath prospered. This is for everyone to experience. Now, sometimes personal experiences are the hardest to deal with and sometimes they're the easiest. I like to say that when it comes to this, I want to be involved. I want to be involved in this process. If I was to ask you, if I was to ask you how many of you want to, how many of you would like to be part of, of building a church, I hope all of you raise your hand. If some of you didn't, then that'd be a little bummer. But anyways, I, I would say that most of you, if not all of you, want to be involved in, in doing something for God. How many of you would like to see something done for God and not be a part of it? I would be bummed, okay? If God built this church, which he's going to build, it's not going to be me. If he's going to build it with his money that, that we all give to him, because it's all his anyway. See, it's all perspective. A lot of this is just perspective. I'd be bummed, I'd be bummed out if I said, I wasn't even a part of that. You know what's nice is you guys, and I mean this legitimately, you guys are like on the ground floor of this. You guys are on the ground floor of God working with this ministry, you guys are all part of this. When we're in that thing 10 years from now, hopefully it's sooner than that, by the way, when we're in this building, we're going to sit back and we're going to look and say, look at all the things God has done. You know what? We're all going to be part of that. We can all say, man, that is so cool to be part of like this. We all gave to this. This is it's exciting, isn't it? This should be a personal thing. It, it, we need to be stewards of this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. God has called us to be faithful. That's what it is. God has called us to be faithful. And he's, he, it's a very personal thing. Giving is very, very personal. It should be planned. It should be personal. And lastly, uh, it should be proportionate. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up in store for him as God hath prospered him. God's not asking for something that, that you don't have. 
I'd like to give and I can put it on a credit card and I'll pay it back when I get it. That's not what God's asking. That's not what God's asking. What God is saying is, as God increases you and your finances, you reciprocate that back to God. It's proportionate. God is only asking for what you already have and what he increases you to have. He's asking for things to be proportionate. I would much rather see $10 from someone who has $10 than $10 from someone who has $1,000. I know that sounds silly. I think it's more amazing. It's, a more, it's, 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 it's more of a testimony to God's work when a small church like this has such significant offerings. And I mean that there's, sometimes I just scratch my head and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, Lord. Like per person, doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you, if you factor in the land that we got last year, this little church brings in almost a half a million dollars. Does that make sense to you? How many make sense to you? That makes sense to me. The, pre, the people who miss out on the blessing are the people who aren't participating in that blessing. By giving back to God what's already his. That, that, that to me just amazes me. We, I sit in amongst a, 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 a group of generous people. And I mean that. I, I, I absolutely mean that. The, the kids are generous. They give. Adults, they give. The only people that take are the IRS. We need to give to the Lord. Let me just give you a quick conclusion, okay? This is really great. I'm going, to, I'm going to illustrate this. Ready? Here we go. 2 Corinthians 9. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now let me explain this. I'm going to give you the picture of a, of a farmer. We're in Iowa. I can do this, right? I'm going to give you old school type of farming. They'd reach into this bag of seed, and they would, uh, they would throw it out, okay? they just kind of throw it out, and they just kind of work it around, just like this. Now, what he's saying here is, he which soweth sparingly. So now take a picture of a guy, and he takes a little bit of seed, and he, and he throws it out. Now, this isn't prosperity gospel. You understand that what he gets back is different than what he put in. I'm not saying you give a million, you're going to get two million. That's not what I'm saying. But now you see this guy reaching this bag and he throws it out. Okay? Who's going to have a better crop? Generally speaking, it's the guy that sows a lot. The guy that's over here and he's sitting out there and he's throwing it and he's throwing it. You guys ever throw grass seed down? That's how I do it. My trick is I throw the grass seed down, then I take a rake and I just pull it over with the tines. And then I throw a little more. And then I pull it over with the tines. And then I water the snot out of it. And usually it does really good. Like, my, like there are some people who just kind of sprinkle it. That's not how you do it. You take that bag and you just, ugh, like that. And whew, whew. it's like a big blanket of grass seed. That's how you do it. It costs more, but you're going to have but you're gonna have a golf course. So you get out there and you throw that seed. You throw that seed. Because the more you throw, the better chance you have of right here, he would showeth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. The person who gives, the, 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 the generous person, has a generous reward. That's what it's saying. Now this isn't, I'm not preaching condemnation to you guys. I'm just preaching that this is Bible. You want to be blessed, you give. That's what I'm saying. The more you give, the more you get. You cannot outgive God. He created, it's all his anyways. So what are we if we lose any of it? Not ours to begin with. When we have a proper perspective, when we see that this doesn't even belong to God, or this doesn't even belong to God, this doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God, let me just retract that. When we see that doesn't belong to us, it's easy to throw it out there, isn't it? It's easy to share what's not yours. So when we have the right perspective, we begin to share more. 
and we begin to reap more. What a blessing it is to give. I know that I could give better. But I pretty much preach this with a very clear conscience. I know I could give better. We all could give better. And this is why it's one of the hardest messages to preach, because I know that this cuts. Because everybody says, it's my money, I worked hard for it. You did work hard for it. You absolutely did work hard for it. This isn't some sort of liberal agenda to say, just spread it all around. <laughs> God's blessed you. God's blessed you, and, 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 and you will be blessed even more. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Now think about this. Think about the Son of God who's in heaven right now, God the Father. The Holy Spirit is working on earth with all the Christians right now, inside of Christians, right? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in us. That's what it says. So the Holy Spirit resides in us. So the Holy Spirit's moving around. God the Father, God the Son, they're in heaven. Imagine for a moment the loneliness that he would experience if he didn't give his son. He wanted to fellowship with all of us. And the most selfless act he could do was to give someone, his son, his only begotten son, to spare all of us that one day we would be fellowshipping with him. Who really makes out the best in this? Go both ways. We make out the best, he makes out the best because he gets to fellowship with all of us. Giving is not bad. Giving is a huge blessing. If all you have is a dollar and you give 10 cents, if you give 11 cents, if you give a dollar, giving to God is all that's asked. Not giving what you don't have. If you don't have millions, you can't give millions. If you have millions, I had, a, I, had a, I had a someone close to me. And this is what they said. They said, if I were to give 10%, this is what they said to me. I would give tens of millions of dollars to the church. And that would eliminate the responsibility for other people to give. I scratched my head. I said, no, nah, they don't go to this church. I wish they did. but <laughs> I, You know what I told them? I said, your responsibility is to give. Don't base your obedience on other pe person's disobedience. God has called you to give. You know, it's neat to see how much God gave for us. He gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. And we give so little to him. Now I just have to step away from the finances. Just a moment. Now this is on planning or giving financially. Let me just say this. If you're not giving your time to God, if you have not given your kids to God, if you have not given your life to God, surrendered your life, that's something you need to do. Now, not in order to be saved. In order to go to heaven, it's very, very, very simple. I want this hand to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. God says, we all have sin. In order to go to heaven, we have to be sinless. We, this sin has to be paid for. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not giving money. The wages of sin is not filling, filling the offering plate. The wages of sin is not obedience to giving money to the church. The wages of sin is not walking an aisle or praying a prayer. The wages of sin is death. Someone had to die. Someone had to die. Now, I might have a bigger offering if I said, you want to get saved and go to heaven, you got to give money. We might have more baptisms if I said, you all got to be baptized in order to go to heaven. But that's not true. It's just simply not true. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Someone had to die for this. Now, you can either die and spend an eternity separated from God forever, or you can allow Jesus Christ, I want this hand, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that he, God, has made sin for us. Isn't that amazing? Someone had to die. Someone had to die. Well, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came to this earth to die on the cross 
to pay for our sin debt. That's how simple it is. He made the payment. If we make the payment, we're going to spend an eternity separated from, from him. So Jesus came to this cross, to the earth, to the cross, to die on the cross for us. And then simply the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not works, not giving money, not walking an aisle, praying a prayer, building the church. Not surrender. Not living a good life. Not turning from sin. Getting water baptized. It's when we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Everything after that is service. But in order to be saved, we trust Jesus alone as our personal Savior. And I pray that everyone here in this room does that. I pray that nobody leaves this room without saying in the quietness of their own mind, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me.